Okay, so welcome to the Ringvorlesung of the uh, IMPRESS International Max Planck Research School at uh, Leipzig. So this semester, the topic is nonlinear algebra. The lecturers are Mateusz Michalek and myself, Bernd Sturmfels. Each of us will give six and a half lectures for a total of 13. And today's lecture, number one, is on polynomials, ideals, and Gröbner bases. So I will sketch the main points, the key ideas, lots of examples. I will not present all the proofs. So all the detail, for example, for this lecture and some other ones, you can find in this undergraduate textbook, Ideals, Varieties, and Algorithms by Cox and O'Shea. And the library has extra copies of this. So this is for detailed reading of the material. So our point of departure is an undergraduate abstract algebra course that uh, most of you will have taken. Sometimes such a course is called groups, rings, fields, the basic algebraic structure. So we're going to start with fields. So a field K, K for Körper in German, might be the field of rational numbers or the field of real numbers with the usual arithmetic addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division. There's also the complex numbers, C, maybe also written as R bar. Um, there are finite fields, F sub Q. So there's a whole zoo of fields. So for Q, any prime power, there is a unique field of that prime power order, FQ. Now, every field, has an essentially unique algebraic closure. So I put a bar to indicate the algebraic closure. So this is a larger field containing the given field and just big enough to allow for solving polynomials in one variable. So the algebraic closure is the smallest field that allows us to factor polynomials in one variable. We can do this to any field, so for example, for a finite field, fp bar would be the algebraic closure. Um, later on, when we talk about uh, tropical geometry, we might get into things like a piadic numbers. Very often, you like to have situations where the, uh, the field depends on parameters, maybe a t or an epsilon if you like calculus, or a Q if you like physics, or a P if you like number theory. So sometimes we have a parameter in here uh, that we can hide into the field, and we can make that algebraically closed. So the field of Peugeot series is such an example. So these are examples of fields. But for the most part, let's start with the first three. The rational numbers, the real numbers, and the complex numbers. Now given a field, we can form the polynomial ring. So the polynomial ring with n unknowns, x1 up to xn. So these are polynomials in n variables, x1 up to xn with coefficients in k. And I will often abbreviate this as x bar. So x bar is the list of unknowns, ordered list x1 up to xn. That's our polynomial ring. Now this in particular is a k-vector space. And this has a very natural k-vector space basis consisting of the so-called monomials. So monomials are polynomials with one term. Binomials are polynomials with two terms and so on. Trinomials are polynomials with three terms, and polynomials, well, they're polynomials with many terms. So monomial is essentially the same thing as a non-negative integer vector a, so x1 to the a1, x2 to the a2, up to xn to the an, and here a is a non-negative integer vector of length n, so I'm going to write n for the set of non-negative integers in this course. And so the monomials form a, it's an infinite set, it's an infinite dimensional k-vector space, and they form a basis. So every polynomial can be written uniquely as a k-linear combination of monomials. 
We might write this representation like this. So if f is a polynomial, we have a sum over all non-negative integer vectors, c a x to the a, so it's a typical polynomial. But this is supposed to be a finite sum, right? So a polynomial, in a polynomial, there are only finitely many of the a's that appear with non-zero coefficient c a in our field k. Now the most basic invariant of a polynomial is its degree. So the degree of the polynomial is the maximum one norm of any of the exponent vectors you see. So I look over all monomials that actually occur with the non-zero coefficient here. Um, so by the one norm, I simply mean these are non-negative vectors. So this is simply a1 plus a2 plus an, the, the sum of the coordinates. And the largest coordinate sum in, among the exponent vectors that you see is the degree of the polynomial f. Now in the handout, so, uh, so you're encouraged to follow along on your device or with the printout, or even better, you're supposed to have read the notes before coming here, right? Because the notes are posted long in advance. You already have the notes for week six. So as you embark on the weekend, you can read ahead, weeks two, three, four, five, and six, and we're catching up. We're gonna produce seven and eight as soon as we can. So the logo that you saw um, is a picture, n equals three, and degree three, so f is a polynomial, two x, y, z, minus x squared, minus y squared, minus z squared plus one. So that would be a polynomial in three variables of degree three. Now here what I'm doing, if n is small, I will usually suppress indices and just use letters x, y, z. So if n is maybe three or four, I will denote the variables not as x1, x2, x3, but as x, y, z, or x, y, z, w, just to save space. Um, the zero set of this polynomial is a beautiful red, yellow surface that you see on the handout. Uh, is the world expert here on uh, these kind of shapes, so you'll speak to him about this. And so this is an example of a polynomial and the zero set is a surface, a cubic surface in three-dimensional space. Now in the title, you find the word ideals. So I told you what polynomials are, so let me tell you what ideals are. So an ideal is a subset I of our polynomial ring such that two axioms hold. So the first axiom says that f is any polyn if f is any polynomial and g is in the subset, then the product f times g is also in the subset. So I'm our ideal is closed under multiplying elements with respect to, with other arbitrary polynomials. And the other thing is that the ideal in particular is a k vector space. So if g and h are an i, then it follows that g plus h are also an i. So these are the two axioms for a subset i of our polynomial ring to be an ideal. Now, of course, I said it's a k-vector space, right? In particular, f can be a scalar k, right? So if f is a non-zero polynomial of degree zero, then uh, I can create k-linear combinations. So in particular, an ideal is a k-vector uh, subspace. Now, in many situations, you are given a set of polynomials, typically a finite set. So uh, suppose f is a finite set of polynomials, then we're going to write bracket f bracket for the ideal generated by this. For the ideal 
generated by f. In this course, I will always underline a term at the moment when it's defined. So I'm, ide I'm underlining ideal generated by, well, I may be not really defining it, I might define it verbally, right? So, so this is the smallest ideal containing the set f. You can check that's equivalent to the set of all finite linear combinations, polynomial linear combinations of the given elements in F, right? So you're given a bunch of polynomials. Well, you're closed under the operations A and B. So uh, you can take linear combinations with polynomial coefficients. And then that's exactly forms an ideal. That must be the smallest ideal containing F. A first statement, proposition. So these uh, propositions and theorems are labeled in the, uh, in the notes, but sometimes the notes change a little bit, so I will state this here without the label. So if I and J are ideals, then you can make new ideals. You can make new from old. So then also I intersected J is an ideal. Also I plus J, so I intersected J, that's just a set theoretic intersection. I plus J is the set of all pair, is the set of all polynomials, something here added to something here, with just the sum you know, of sets. Um, then we have the product I times J that requires a definition. So this by definition is the ideal generated by all products uh, where f is in i and g is in j. So here I have an infinite set of polynomials. Typically there'll be infinitely many f's that I'm picking from i. There's infinitely many g's that I'm picking from j. Well, the set of products is not closed under linear combination, so therefore I have to actually form the ideal generated by this. And this new ideal I'm gonna call I times GF. So you can intersect, add, and multiply ideals. And last but not least, you can form quotients of ideals. So the ideal quotient, I colon J, is the set of all polynomials with the property that F times J is contained in I. Okay, so that's a, a quotient construction. So this F times J is the set of all polynomials F times something where something is in J. So what I'm saying is that this infinite set of polynomials is contained in this infinite set of polynomials. The set of all F's that enjoy this property that is the colon or quotient ideal, I colon J. Let's uh, go through these definitions. So it's not difficult you know, to check these properties. So what you need to do is you need to check that the axioms A and B hold. And in, in the notes, I worked this out. So for I intersected J, it's, it's obvious, but in the notes I wrote, I spelled this out for the colon ideal. So you need to check that uh, if you have, for example, if you have any element here, gives me another arbitrary polynomial, well then the product is also there, using the fact that i and j already satisfy the axioms. But let's in instead talk a little bit about polynomials in one variable, because those are the ones you'll probably be most familiar with from the undergraduate groups rings fields class. So, Let's talk a little bit about polynomials in one variable and see some examples. So example, n equals one. Well, polynomials in one variable are special. So polynomials in one variable, they're very special because they have an algorithm, a very special algorithm called the Euclidean algorithm. So 
So the Euclidean algorithm, going back to Euclid, is most familiar in the ring of integers. And you use it to compute the greatest common divisor of two integers. So if you have two integers like 12 and 16, then you apply the Euclidean algorithm, you do some steps, and furnishes the GCD, four in this case. The ring of integers is very much like a polynomial ring in one variable. So properties, the ring of integers get inherited by polynomials in one variable over a field K. So there is a Euclidean algorithm. Um, there's also, and that's going to become important later on, there's something called the extended Euclidean algorithm. Well, when you're done computing the GCD, what you like to do, you like to write that GCD as a linear combination of the two given integers, let's say, right? So let's say you apply the Euclidean algorithm to two integers like I don't know, 16 and 29, then you find that the GCD is one. But in fact, then one can be written as an integer times 16 plus an integer times 29. And you can peel off those integers by keeping track with your steps in the Euclidean algorithm. And then that furnishes you this uh, linear combination. So the extended Euclidean algorithm is the Euclidean algorithm with memory. And so this Euclidean algorithm with memory works verbatim in a polynomial ring in one variable. So uh, in algebra language, we say that the polynomial ring in one variable is a PID, is a principal ideal domain. Polynomial ring in one variable is a principal ideal domain. OK, so now let's look at some examples. So principal ideal domain means that every ideal is generated by a single polynomial. And that's a consequence, namely the GCD. Right? So my little 1629 example just said that uh, the ideal generated by 16 and 29 in the ring of integers is, in fact, all integers. It's the ideal generated by 1. And uh, by carrying out the Euclidean algorithm, you can take any finite list of polynomials in one variable, replace it by their GCD, and that GCD will generate the same ideal. So every ideal is generated by a single element. So for example, let's look at the polynomial x cubed plus 6x squared plus 12x plus 8. So this generates an ideal in a polynomial ring in one variable. And in this example, my field will be the rational numbers. OK? Let's take a, a second um, ideal, j, generated by x squared plus x minus 2. And let's calculate these four new ideals for, uh, for this ideal. So let's calculate i intersected j. Let's calculate i times j, the product. Let's calculate i plus j. And then finally, let's uh, calculate the colon, uh, i colon j. And sometimes people put parentheses around this. Now, to do these calculations, it helps by hand. So if you like calculations, if you are afraid of using computer, then you might prefer to do these things by hand. By hand, uh, generally, people like to factor polynomials. So because it sort of gives them a little bit of control. So let's actually factor these polynomials. So, uh, so this polynomial is uh, x plus 2 cubed. And this polynomial was chosen to be x minus 1 times x plus 2. So uh, this is the, the irreducible factorization of these two polynomials. Um, and I'm just doing this for purpose of illustration. So in practice, when you run, you know, when you do these ideal calculations, you will do them without factoring. So because these ideal operations are actually faster than factoring. But just for the purpose of illustration, let me do the factorization. And let me remark, uh, as a side note, that the polynomial ring in any number of variables is a UFD. A UFD is a unique factorization domain. 
So if you have a polynomial in any number of variables over a field k, then it factors uniquely and essentially uniquely into a product of irreducible polynomials. So this works in any number of variables. So polynomial ring in any number of variables is a UFD, unique factorization domain. But to be a PID, that only works in one variable. So only in one variable, you are a principal ideal domain. OK, in any case, we factored these things. So then the intersection here is x minus 1 times x plus 2 cubed. So this corresponds to the LCM, the least common multiple. So intersecting corresponds to least common multiples. Uh, addition of ideals corresponds to uh, GCD, the greatest common divisor. Uh, the product here in this case, well, in the polynomial ring in one variable, or more generally for a principal ideal, all you need to do is multiply the principal generators. So this will be generated by x minus 1 times x plus 2 to the fourth. And then uh, perhaps the least familiar one, the ideal quotient. So the ideal quotient, we're looking at the set of all polynomials that uh, multiply this polynomial into that ideal. So we're looking for polynomials f with the property that if I multiply my f by this quadratic polynomial, I land you know, and be a multiple of that one. And uh, the smallest, stingiest such f would be x plus 1 times x plus 2. That indeed generates this ideal. OK, um, uh, did I make a mistake? Minus 1. Thank you for paying attention. That's a minus 1, OK? Am I good? Oh, I still need a power of 2. You're absolutely right. That's right. This one is not good enough. Uh, if I'm out. Oh, I'm sorry. I did the other way around. Huh? OK. And I made a mistake. Um, I would appreciate, so it's like this. Is that right? Uh, please send me corrections to the notes. So in real time, please look at the notes right now. It's quite likely that I made the same mistake in the notes. Yeah, I didn't. Well, if I did, then you take out your cell phone and you send me an email right away. So Now another thing that you typically learn when you study um, polynomials in uh, one variable is the so-called Chinese remainder theorem. Okay. Also known as the Chinesische Restklassensatz to the German speakers. Um, so that's also an important theorem that you might want to review. Mathematics is done by people. Mathematics is a cultural entity. So the fact that this is called the Chinese remainder theorem tells us that traditionally, so this is the Chinese remainder theorem. And uh, this might be a good moment to think about what is the Chinese remainder theorem. What does it tell us? The blackboard is full, so now I have to erase and continue. So that's a particularly good moment to ask a question. So while I erase, you can think about your question, and then we can try to answer it. <clears throat> OK, any question? Ideals you just had, they were generated by just one polynomial. Uh -huh. And then these operations also led to generators consisting only of one polynomial. That's Is correct. The general rule? Yeah, so in one variable, these operations, these ideal operations, are sim basically simula simulate the uh, LCM and the GCD. So in one variable, it's basically cooked up by doing least common multiples and greatest common divisors. But the point of this talk today is to say how we're going to do this in more than one variable. Okay, that's the purpose of this lecture. Okay, so let's dive deeper 
into the discussion of ideals and quotient rings. So ideals, an ideal in general in a ring is very much like a normal subgroup of a group. Right? When you study group theory, groups have subgroups, and you would like to form a quotient. You would like to take the big group and divide it by the subgroup and form a quotient group. But that won't work unless the subgroup is special. It has to be normal. And normal subgroups are exactly those subgroups that allow you to pass to a quotient group. Same thing with rings. So rings have subrings, and you'd like to take a ring, modulo a subring, and pass to a factor, a quotient ring, but it won't work unless that ring is a very special ring, a normal subring, and a normal subring is called an ideal. Okay? So ideals, just for historic reasons, they're called ideals. Ideals are, I should think of as normal subrings. They're those subrings of a ring that allow you to pass to a quotient ring. So in our setting, we can form the quotient ring. So in our setting, the ambient ring is a polynomial ring and n variables, k of x. And then we mod out to form the quotient ring. So this is the quotient vector space. So it's a set of all cosets, uh, something plus i. And uh, these somethings plus i you know, form a ring. You can multiply and add. So it's the quotient vector space with the ring structure. Now in practice, how do you compute? How to compute? in this ring. That's going to be occupying us. Well, even when you study you know, basic situations, let's take the ring of integers and take the ideal generated by 12. Right? Well, then there is a quotient ring, and that gives you arithmetic on a traditional clock. Right? That's a finite quotient ring, z mod 12, which mirrors, you know, addition of time on a watch. But in this case, how do you compute in a, in a quotient ring? Well, in particular, it would be very convenient to have a k vector space basis. Okay. Now, the ambient polynomial ring had a very natural k vector space basis, namely the monomials. But this quotient ring a priori doesn't. Now, as you study mathematics, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who think that vector spaces come with the basis, and then there are those who think they don't. Now, most mathematicians are in the don't camp, right? But some are in the do camp, and I'm in the do camp, and maybe is in the do camp. So for me, every vector space comes with the basis, but sometimes you have to do a little work to unearth this basis, and I will show you how to do that in this case. OK, um, let's do a chart that relates properties of the ideal. I'm going to give you a table with properties of an ideal. And the, proper, the associated property of the quotient ring. So this property will have a definition. And then this will turn into a property of the quotient ring, k of x mod i. So I'm going to give you four adjectives that we might attribute to an ideal. So the first adjective is maximal. Well, ideal is maximal if it's as big as it can get, right? So it has to be a proper subset. It's a proper subset of the ring of polynomials. But if you throw in one more element, then you get the whole ring, right? So that's a maximal ideal. Another way to say that is uh, if you have any, non any element that's not in the ideal, then f is invertible, has a multiplicative inverse, modulo i. Okay, so 
that's equivalent. So any element that's outside the ideal, if you throw it in, you get the whole ring, you get one in the ideal, and then therefore that element becomes invertible mod i. It has a multiplicative inverse. Now the corresponding property of the quotient ring is called a field. So the polynomial ring, the ring mod the ideal is a field if and only if the ideal is a maximal ideal. Another adjective that you might have is prime. Prime is a more inclusive, slightly weaker property. So now you'll prime is f times g. If you have a product of polynomials that's in the ideal, then either f is in the ideal or g is in the ideal. So that's a prime ideal. Prime ideal, and that of course does not come from prime rib or prime time, but it comes from prime numbers. So the adjective prime, so prime numbers have this property in the ring of integers. Ideals generated by prime numbers. So those are prime ideals. Now the ring, the property of ring is called integral domain, or sometimes just domain. Okay. So, so if you have a, a prime ideal, then the quotient modulo of the prime ideal will be an integral domain. Another thing, again, slightly more inclusive, is a radical ideal. So an ideal can be radical. Yes, question? An integral domain, by definition, is if it's a ring in which the zero ideal is prime. Okay, you can use either way. So if you know what this is, then you know what that is. If you know what that is, then you know what that is. Okay? So that's the definition. Okay? Now radical um, means the following. So suppose there exists a non-negative integer s. So suppose there exists a non-negative integer s such that f to the s is an i. Then this already implies that f is an i. Okay? So whenever you have some power, no matter how large, if some power of your ideal, some power of your polynomial is in, whenever a power of a polynomial is in the ideal, then already that polynomial is in the ideal, then we call that a radical ideal. And the ring, that's called no nilpotent elements. Right? So an element is nilpotent if some power is zero. Right? So if you're, a, if you're in a ring, it could happen like so that uh, you know, some power is, is zero. So for example, in the clock, take the element six. Right? So the element six would be nilpotent because it's square zero in Z mod 12. So that's the, the ring property, no nilpotent, corresponds to the adjective radical for ideals. I'm going to give you one more <coughs> that might be the least familiar. So that's primary. So primary is sort of a, a cousin of prime. So an ideal is primary if it's almost prime, not quite. So suppose you have a product in i, then either f is an i or some power of g is an i. There exists an s such that g to the s is an i. Okay? So primary means that uh, you know, as soon as you have a, a product in the ideal, then either the first factor is in the ideal or some power of the other factor is in the ideal. So going back to the ring of integers, right? So the ideal generated by four, the element four, is a primary ideal. But it's not a prime ideal, right? Because um, two times two is four, and neither two, two is not in the ideal. Right? So this is a primary ideal. And here it says in the ring language, this says that every zero divisor Every zero divisor is not potent. So a zero divisor in the ring is an element that multiplied by somebody else becomes zero. So an integral domain means there are no zero divisors. Okay? It's just a little bit of language, algebra language um, coming from rings, and we're going to be interested in these kind of things in the ring of polynomials. Now, how are these adjectives related? Let's uh, state a couple relationships among them. So, well, 
Well, proposition. If an ideal is maximal, then it's prime. But prime implies both radical. It also applies primary. But radical and primary, neither one implies the other. Okay. So uh, every maximal ideal is a prime ideal. Every prime ideal is a radical ideal. Also, every prime ideal is a primary ideal. But you know these things uh, have no implications. So again, so in the ring of integers, for example, the uh, the ideal generated by six is a radical ideal that is not a primary, and the ideal generated by four is a primary ideal that is not a radical ideal. Now another useful fact is that every intersection of prime ideals is radical. Right? Now that holds, um, well, to show this, it suffices to show that the intersection of two radical ideals is a radical ideal. And that turns out to be true. But moreover, the converse is true as well. So uh, it turns out that uh, in a polynomial ring, to be a radical ideal is the same as being an intersection of prime ideals. So what we're doing here is a little bit like language immersion. Right? So there are many non-German students or impress participants. They are encouraged to take a German language class, and then you learn German, you travel to Weimar, and all that. So here, now, welcome to algebra land. So this is sort of just algebra language, um, things like you know, PID, UFD, you know, primary, maximal, prime, just a bunch of language that algebraists use to speak about what's happening in a ring. But of course, we're going to be very interested in examples. Because after all, the afternoon session is the important part in the class. So let's jump to an exercise. Let me ask a question. So this is exercise one. OK. So we're going to be in the polynomial ring in two variables. We're going to ask whether a certain principal ideal happens to be prime. Is this a prime ideal in R, X, Y? And the ideal generator is, let me get this correct, X cubed plus 3 X squared Y plus 23 Y cubed plus 9 X, Y minus X plus Y minus 1. And this, Tim, should match with what's in the notes. Okay, that's a cubic polynomial, a polynomial of degree 3 in two variables. And my question to the audience is, is this a prime ideal in the polynomial ring R, X, Y? So the experts, so anybody who has a PhD that has remotely something to do with algebra, don't follow the next 10 minutes, answer this question. I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to ask you because you're in the first row, but I'm going to ask something. Okay. So that's the kind of questions we would like to discuss. How do you decide whether an ideal is prime? How do you decide whether a polynomial is irreducible? Now, in the integers, this is very familiar. In the polynomials in one variable, it's reasonably familiar. But as soon as we have polynomials in two variables, well, let's see what we can come up with. Now, here's an important fact about rings. There is no canonical basis, no canonical notion a priori of a basis for ideals, or more generally for modules. Now, when you take undergraduate linear algebra, you very much have a notion of a basis, right? So if you have a finite dimensional vector space over a field, then any two minimal generating sets of that vector space have the same cardinality. That's an amazing metroidal fact, right? So any two minimal generating sets of a vector space over a field have the same cardinality. That cardinality is called the dimension 
or rank if you speak about matrices. Now, that is not true if you replace the field by a ring, right? So if you replace the field by a ring, the vector space is called module, ideals being special cases. And it's not true that two minimal generating sets have the same cardinality. Let's see a very simple example. So, very simple example. Again, even in our good old friend, the polynomial ring in one variable. So let's take the set of polynomials in one variable, x to the sixth minus one, x to the 10 minus one, and x to the 15 minus one. Now this set of three elements minimally generates a certain principal ideal. In fact, in this ring, every ideal is principal. It's a PID after all, right? So the GCD of these is x minus one. And that's a minimal generating set. So those three polynomials are a minimal generating set. If you throw out any of the three polynomials, you get a strictly smaller ideal. Okay, so I have two minimal generating sets of the same ideal. I have this three element minimal generating set. I have this one element minimal generating set and they generate the same ideal, okay? So this is typical, that's a normal behavior. So what you learned in undergraded linear algebra or field, that was weird. This is the normal behavior if uh, you work with ideals, modules and, and more general algebraic structures. So they will not have the same cardinality, okay? But of course, undergraded linear algebra was quite nice. And if we want to develop a course called non-linear algebra, we certainly want to build on everything we know from undergraded linear algebra, such as Gaussian elimination. Because, you know, if we have linear polynomials, then things are not so bad. So let's look at a linear example for n equals three. Okay, so let's say, I look at the ideal generated by 2x plus 3y plus 5z plus 7 and 11x plus 13y, you can see where this is going, 17z plus 19 and one more, let's take 23x plus 29y plus 31z plus 37. Okay, so they generate, these three are polynomials of degree one in three variables. They generate an ideal, but of course, what you are tempted to do and what you will do, either by hand or by computer, you will take this linear system and replace these three generators by three simpler generators. You will form the three by four coefficient matrix, you will do row operations, and that's called Gaussian elimination. And then you'll find, you could also write this as 7z minus 16, 7y plus 12, and then uh, 7z plus nine, okay? So in the linear case, the minimal generating sets have a given cardinality, right? So any two, if I have these linear ideals, any two generating sets have the same cardinality, but we might like one more than the other, right? So we like the one on the right better on the left, right? The left is called the problem and the right is called the solution, right? We see that these three equations have one solutions in three space, namely the point with coordinates 16 over seven minus nine over seven, uh, I'm sorry, minus 12 over seven, which is three quarters, and then uh, minus nine over seven, okay? So Gaussian elimination is a method for solving systems of linear equations. Okay, so how can we deal with polynomials that are nonlinear in more than one variable? How can we solve nonlinear equations in two or more variables? Well, before we can even think about solving polynomial equations, let's agree on how we even write down a polynomial. What's a good way to write a polynomial? Right? 
Well, typically in one variable, what you do is you start with the highest term, and then you write the second term, and so on. At the end comes the constant term, right? So most of us, when you write down a polynomial in one variable, we know how to list the monomials. There's a natural progression. Now, what about polynomials in two or more variables, right? To specify how we write them down, we need something called a monomial order, an ordering on monomials. And here's a very important combinatorial fact called Dixon's lemma. Dixon's lemma says that any infinite subset of n to the n, n to the n, the non-negative integer vectors or equivalent the set of monomials, right? So I'm going to sometimes just call this the set of monomials. So if you have any infinite set in there, then there has to be a pair of distinct elements that's comparable. Comparable pair. A less or equal B. So by A less or equal B, I mean component-wise. So if A is an integer vector and B is an integer vector, I'm going to write A less or equal B. If A1 is less or equal B1 and A2 is less or equal B2 and A3 is less or equal B3 and so on. Okay? Or equivalently, the monomial X to the A divides the monomial X to, to the B. So if Amanda has a very, 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 very long list of monomials, then in her list there will be two, where the first divides the second, or the other way around. Okay? You cannot have an infinite set of monomials, no two of which divide each other. That's Dixon's lemma. Now, when you write this greater, equal, lesser, equal sign, I mean, you might also think about the monomials as a post set, or partially ordered set. Right? So. So if you like the, uh, so this is the post set for n equals 2. So this is the Hasse diagram of the partially ordered set or post set of monomials and two variables with respect to divisibility. Right? So uh, here's 1, x, y, x squared, and so on. Right? So that the, represents the partial order. And what Dixon's lemma says is that in this post set, this post set is an infinite post set, an infinite partially ordered set. There are no infinite anti-chains. There is an anti-chain as a collection of elements, no two of which are compact. Okay? There are no infinite uh, anti-chains. The proof um, is, is in the notes. <coughs> it's proved by induction on n. So for n equals 1, it's obvious, right? And then you prove it for n by assuming that it's true for smaller n, and you kind of give a combinatorial argument, okay? No infinite anti-chains. Now, a corollary to this, an important corollary, is that if you have any set of monomials, so any subset, m in n to the n, it has only finitely many minimal elements. Again, in the uh, coordinate-wise order as the visibility. Right? So if you have any collection, well, why? Well, suppose there were infinitely many minimal elements. The, the minimal elements, by definition, are incomparable. So you know, if you have a bunch of monomials, so an element is minimal if it's not a multiple of anybody else. Right? So if you have your bag of monomials, you throw out everybody who is a multiple of somebody else. Right? What you're left with is a bunch of monomials. No two are divisible. Or no, no, no pairs are no divisible. And that has to be a finite set. Okay? So that's an immediate corollary. So any collection of monomials has only finitely many minimal elements with respect to divisibility. Now with this, we can define monomial ordering. So a total order. I'm going to use this letter. So this is, if you are a LaTeX aficionado, this is a prec slash prec, okay? So 
So a total order slash prac on n to the n is said to be a monomial order if it satisfies two axioms. Well, the first axiom is that the zero vector is the smallest, so uh, less or equal to a. So this is slash prac eq. Okay. So, so this says it's a to now it's a total order. So by a total ordering, I mean any two things are comparable. So I make a list. I'm listing all the monomials. First the smallest monomial, then the next monomial, the next monomial, the next monomial, the next monomial. And the first, the smallest monomial is the vector 0, 0, 0, also known as 1 as a monomial. Okay? So the one monomial is going to be the smallest. Okay? That's the first axiom. And the second axiom is if A is less or equal, is, is less or equal to B in this order, and then somebody else comes along, C, and wants to get added in, then the order stays the same. And these two things are true for all A, B, C in N to the F. Okay. So in monomial language, this says I have uh, two monomials, right? So two monomials. Okay, so multiplication by a new monomial preserves the previous ordering relationship. Now, in one variable, this uniquely nails it, right? So in one variable, there's only one monomial ordering, and it's the one that you're familiar with, right? Because one is the smallest monomial, well, then comes x. But of course, if one is less than x, you multiply by x, then x has to be less than x squared. We do it again, then x squared has to be less than x cubed, and so on. So in one variable, these two axioms specify the ordering that you're familiar with. But in two or more variables, there's lots of room. And there are different choices that you can choose. And here are three possibilities. So the first one is the dictionary order, the so-called lexicographic order. So in the lexicographic order, A is less than B if the first non-zero, okay? How are you guys doing over there? Everything okay? Okay, so I'm going to say in the A is lexiographically less than B if the first, the leftmost, non-zero entry of the vector B minus A is positive. Okay, that's the lexiographic order. So you have these two integer vectors, you read them from left to right, right? So they might be the, the first coordinate might be the same. Well, then you go to the second coordinate, it might be the same. But at some point, they're going to differ for the first time, and then the winner is that de determines who the winner is, okay? That's lexiographic. Now, then there's something called degree lexiographic. So there, what we're going to do is that we're going to say that A is less than B in degree lexiographic order if bar A is less as a number to bar B, where well, this is the one norm. If the degree of A is less than the degree of B, and only after they have the same degree, if they have the same degree, then you break ties lexiographically. I'm going to say A is less lexiographically than B. Okay? So these are two different orders. Right? So you can, in the first one, you're just using the lexiographic order straight. Okay? In the second one, we say, well, wait a minute. Let's first you know, partially order things by total degree, but then within each degree, we're going to use lexiographic. Okay? Okay, now comes the third one. The third one is reverse lex, sometimes called also degree reverse lex. So reverse lexiographic is the following. Okay. So I'm going to say A is less than B. Well, first of all, I'm going to go by total degree again. So uh, 
if we have, okay, if A is less than B, or they have the same degree, and the following holds, and the last non-zero entry of B minus A is negative. So there's a double negation. Now I'm going to take these two vectors. I'm reading them from the right to the left. And then when the first time there's a disagreement, then the smaller guy wins over the larger guy. Okay? Okay? So that's very important. Now you check that these satisfy the axiom. So these are total orderings on monomials, and they satisfy the axiom. Then would, would uh, the structure uh, defined by, like, like we do for a reverse lexicographic ordering, uh, where we leave out the um, degree condition, not satisfy the... Uh, that is correct. So if you just take this sentence only, it would violate the second axiom, right? So if you just run the second one, so this just says, even for n equals 1, right? So the last non-zero entry of b minus a is negative. So this would say in one variable that 1 is bigger than x. Because the vector 0 minus the vector 1 has a negative entry, namely minus 1. Okay? So there is no pure reverse lexicographic. Or a reverse lexicographic must follow a degree compatibility in the beginning. Very, very important. Excellent question. Okay? Now, of course, each of these orderings comes in n factorial flavors, right? So first of all, I'm specifying the variable ordering. So if I'm in three variables, so I will tell you typically when three variables, they're called x, y, z. First, I tell you how the variables are ordered. I'm going to say x is bigger than y is bigger than z. And then I'm going to say lex, degree lex, or reverse lex, okay? So the n factorial versions, first of all, there's one such thing per ordering of the variables. Um, quick reminder, the important component in this course is the afternoon session where we discuss exercises. So for example, we might ask the following exercise number two, for n equals 2, define a monomial ordering such that 2, 3 is less than 4, 2 is less than 1, 4. Okay, so I claim there is a monomial ordering that has this property. I mean, two variables. and x squared y comes before x to the fourth y squared comes before x times y to the fourth. Okay? It's not going to be one of those. It's going to be a different one. Okay? You have to think about this. That's the exercise. Um, remark. <clears throat> Given a uh, monomial ordering, and given any set of monomials, then this has a unique minimal element. With respect to this ordering. So with respect to the ordering. Okay? And that follows from Dixon's lemma. That's a corollary to Dixon's lemma. Right? Well, by the second axiom, a monomial ordering refines the visibility. So it's a linear extension of the visibility ordering. It's a refinement of the visibility. So therefore, if you have any bag of monomials, any infinite bag of monomials, then that you know, infinite bag will be linearly ordered. And I claim it has a unique smallest element. There will be a smallest element. Why so? Well, by, by Dixon, there's a finite set of minimal element with respect to divisibility, and then that finite set is linearly ordered. Okay. So that's an immediate consequence of 
Dixon's lemma and the fact and axiom B. Let's do one example and then take the break. <coughs> so, uh, example. <coughs> Let's say we are in three variables, n equals three, and my variables are called x, y, and z, and x is bigger than y is bigger than z. Okay? Now let's look at the following polynomial. So f is the polynomial x squared plus xz squared plus y cubed. Okay? That's a polynomial in three variables of degree three. Then the initial monomial, I'm going to write in the sublex of f. So by the initial monomial, I mean the highest monomial that appears with non-zero coefficient with respect to the monomial order. So I have a total order of the monomials. I'm going to write my monomial, the highest term, the next term, next term, and then the highest term is also called the initial term. So the lexiographic initial term is x squared, right? x squared is bigger than these other two guys in lexiographic order, right? So if you write these as words in the dictionary, xx, xzz, yyy, and then xxx comes first. Okay? That's the highest. On the other hand, for degree lex, the initial ideal, the initial monomial with respect to degree lex is the middle guy. Right? That's x times z squared. Right? Because in degree lexographic, only the last two guys run for competition because they have degree 3 and the one of degree two loses out, right? And then xz squared wins because it has more x, okay? But in reverse lex, in reverse lex, it's the last one. y cubed is the highest, right? By in reverse lex. Now some novices, when they see this for the first time, they might believe that the reverse lexicographic order is simply the lexicographic order with the reversed variable order. Nothing, nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. And we'll see something, see evidence for this in a moment. Okay? They're structurally very different. Reverse lex is structurally very, very different. I'm going to say this one more time, right? This one is the leading term in degree in degree lex. Because x is so expensive that it makes this one the leading term. In this case, z is so cheap, it makes this one the trailing term. Okay? So in lexiographic, you have the highest variable. It's really so variable, so expensive, that it determines who is the highest. In reverse lex, there's this small, very tiny, inexpensive variable z. That's so inexpensive, it will determine who is last. Thanks for your attention. We'll continue in five minutes. So if you have an ideal, so if i is an ideal in the polynomial ring, and you also have a monomial order, You fix a monomial order, then the so-called initial ideal or leading ideal, the initial ideal is n of i. So it's the initial ideal of the ideal with respect to the chosen fixed monomial order. And it's the ideal generated by all initial monomials. What's the ideal generated by all initial monomials? Okay. Now this is an infinite set of monomials, right? So i is an ideal. As soon as it's not zero, it's an infinite set of polynomials. For each of these polynomials, I look at the initial monomial. That's an infinite set of monomials. And then I look at the ideal generated by those infinitely many monomials. That's called the initial ideal. Okay. Now it turns out that actually we only need to look at finitely many. So proposition 
So given the fixed term order, every ideal has a finite subset G such that the initial ideal is generated by the finitely many monomials coming from that finite subset. Okay. So what we're saying is that this ideal is actually generated by finitely many monomials, and those finitely many monomials come from finitely many polynomials. Um, such a set is called a Grubner basis. So we call G a Grubner basis. for the ideal i with respect to the ordering. Let's prove this. As you might guess, this will be derived from Dixon's lemma, so not so difficult, so proof. Suppose no such g exists. What that means is that there is a list of polynomials that exist f1, f2, f3 in I such that none of the monomials, no monomial, none of the leading monomials divides any other leading monomial. any other initial monomial, but this contradicts Dixon. This contradicts Dixon's lemma. Right. In other words, Monomial ideals are finitely degenerate. Right? You have a fine inf any whenever you have an infinite list of monomials, well, there's only finitely many minimal elements with respect to divisibility, and they will be good enough to generate the monomial ideal, and therefore we have the existence of a finite Grobner basis for any ideal. Okay? Now it turns out, and uh, the next theorem in the notes that if G satisfies this property, so if G is a Grubner basis, is a Grubner basis for I, then actually the Grubner basis generates, okay? Um, Again, it's not so hard to prove, right? So, so remember, I did not specify in the definition of Grobner basis, I did not put into the definition that G generates I. All I said is the leading monomials generate the leading ideal. Okay, so a Grobner basis, by definition, is a finite subset of the ideal such that the initial monomials from that finite subset generate the initial ideal. As a consequence, you'll find that the polynomials themselves generate their ideal. Proof. Well, suppose not, right? Suppose G did not generate I. Well, that's too bad. G doesn't generate I. Well, then there exists a smallest criminal among all polynomials in the difference, in the set difference of the ideal minus what's generated by the Grubner base. There will be somebody some polynomial whose leading monomial is smallest by, with respect to the monomial ordering, and that's by one of our lemmas, right? Our lemma said that every infinite collection of monomials has a unique smallest element, and by that, there is a smallest criminal. Okay, look at the smallest criminal. His leading term 
will be a multiple of one of the leading terms in G. Subtract. And you found a smaller criminal, and that's a contradiction. Okay? So Dixon's lemma is very, very, very powerful. Dixon's lemma gives you a lot of these kind of existence statements in, in this game. Okay? So now we have a concept of a Grobner basis. Now the word basis is misleading. Okay? Because this is not a basis in any sense whatsoever. It's a generating set. It just generates in this sense. Right? But of course, if you take any superset of a Grobner basis, it's still a Grobner basis. Right? So there's no sense of minimality. So the term basis is for historic reasons. So Grobner sounds like a German. German lived in Austria, but of course he was Italian. Right? He was born in the border region. You know, a German, small sliver of German speakers in Italy. But then he was professor in Tyrolia for many, many years. And back in Tyrolia in the Alpine Valleys, they just called this a basis. Okay? But it should have been really called a generating set. No minimality. OK, so we have a concept of a Grobner basis. And there's nothing minimal about it. <clears throat> but it has an important corollary, let me note. Following corollary, that's a theorem of Hilbert, Hilbert's basis theorem. It's an immediate consequence. It says that every ideal in a polynomial ring in n variables over a field k has a finite generating set, is finitely generated. Well, why is that? Well, pick a monomial order. Monomial orderings exist. There will be a finite Grobner basis with respect to this monomial ordering. That Grobner basis generates the ideal. Okay? So therefore, ideals are finally generated. So in a polynomial ring over a field, every ideal has a finite generating set. It's finitely generated. It's a, a prove a theorem by Hilbert from 1890, the basis theorem. Now let's get to some minimality. Okay, so I said a priori Grobner bases do not have any minimality, but we would like them to be minimal, and that uh, leads us to the concept of a reduced Grobner basis. So a Grobner basis G is a reduced Grobner basis. If the following two axioms hold, <clears throat> first of all, every polynomial is monic, by which I mean that the leading coefficient is 1. The leading coefficient of each g in the basis is 1. And B, if you have two elements, two distinct elements in the basis, then no monomial in G is a multiple of the other guy's initial term. Okay, that's a reduced Grobner basis. Now they exist and they are actually unique. So theorem. Now you have uniqueness. So every ideal I has a unique reduced Grobner basis when the term or the monomial ordering is fixed. Okay. Um, it's not so hard to prove. So this proof and all proofs you can find in the textbook by Cox Loche, which will be in many versions, hard copy, electronically in the library, you know. 
Dinosaurs, I love dinosaurs. Well, a book is a physical thing that you touch and it has pages and you open it, you sit down and you can read all the proofs in the physical book. But of course, you know, this day and age, you'll do this on your cell phone, right? So you can do Grubner Bayes on your cell phone. In fact, you can compute Grubner Bayes on your cell phone. Siri, compute me a Grubner basis, right? That's it's up to you how you compute. We just want to make sure you're not afraid of computing. Okay? No fear of computing. But how you do it is up to you. You could do it on your cell phone. Okay? So ideals have unique reduced Grubner base. It's easy to prove, actually. So what you do, question is Buchberger's algorithm. For computing Grobner bases. So Buchberger's algorithm transforms any finite set F. So if you have any finite collection of polynomials and n variables into the unique reduced Grubner basis of the ideal generated by f with respect to the term order. Okay. So Buchberger's algorithm is the workhorse in all of this. It's the workhorse. So the input to the algorithm is any finite list of polynomials and the monomial ordering. And the output is a unique list of polynomials, namely the unique reduced Grubner basis for that ideal with respect to the chosen monomial ordering. Well, we'll see a couple examples. Um, I sometimes say it's like this. There are two kinds of mathematicians. There are mathematicians who use Grubner bases, and then there are mathematicians who use Grubner bases, but they didn't know that they're called Grubner bases. Right? So everybody uses Grubner bases, because as soon as you write down algebraic expressions and you eliminate and you add terms, and as soon as you do something with nonlinear, even linear algebraic expressions, you're pretty much inventing Grubner bases. Okay? So let's make this more precise. So Grubner bases certainly generalize the Euclidean algorithm that's the case for n equals 1 and they also generalize a common generalization of the Euclidean algorithm and Gaussian elimination, which works for linear polynomials. Right, so, so you can think about Grobner basis as a multivariate version of the Euclidean algorithm, or you can think of it as a higher degree version of a nonlinear version of Gaussian elimination. That's pretty much what it is. Okay? That's what Grubner bases do. And the most basic algorithm for computing Grubner bases was found by Buchberger in his 1965 dissertation, written under the supervision of Wolfgang Grubner. And since he was a very nice student, he named his invention after his advisor. How nice is that? Okay? So this is the Buchberger algorithm. <laughs> Let's do an example. <clears throat> so in three variables, we're fixing the lexicographic ordering where x is bigger than y is bigger than z. So let's say f is x, y minus z, x, z minus y, and y, z minus x. Okay, nice symmetric system of very simple quadratic polynomial. So we're feeding this to the Buchberger algorithm and the unique Grubner basis is x minus yz, y squared minus z squared, yz squared minus y, 
and z cubed minus c. So it's a custom sometimes to underline the initial monomials. So I'm listing the output, the reduced Grobner basis, I'm underlining the initial monomials. So the initial ideal is generated by x, y squared, yz squared, and z cubed. Um, we're going to come in a moment. Um, now, the output reveals information, right? So, if, for example, you see from the output that the ideal is not a prime ideal, right? So, you can see, for example, you have y squared minus z squared in the ideal, uh, but neither of the factors is in the ideal. So, you see from the input it's not clear whether this is a prime ideal or not, but the output shows something. In fact, the output can be used to solve the system of equations, right? So suppose you have the following applied problem. You know, we're looking for three numbers such that the product of any two is the third, right? Those are the, the zeros, the common zeros of f, right? So I'm looking for three numbers x, y, z such that x, y is equal to z, x, z is equal to y, and y, z is equal to x. How many solutions does this have? Well, the answer is well, I don't know what the answer is, but let's uh, look at the so-called standard monomials. I claim there's five so-called standard monomials. I'll give you the definition in a moment. So the standard monomials. So these are all the monomials that are not in the initial ideal. So, so there are precisely five monomials, namely one, x, y, is that five? Looks like six, huh? Okay, x is not, okay. So one, y, z, y, z, and z squared. These are not divisible by any of the underlying leading monomials. Those are the so-called standard monomials. I'll tell you in a second why they're important. And, uh, well, how many zeros? Does F have? Okay. Well, this lexicographic Grobner basis triangularizes the system, and right? it shows us what the solutions are. There are five solutions. Okay. Either x, y, and z are all zero, or they have, you know, their plus or minus ones and there are four possibilities. Right? So those are the five solutions to the system of equations. So the number of solutions in this example is equal to the number of standard monomials to be defined now. So this last part, so we've covered 80% of the lecture. So now comes the last fifth of the lecture. And this last fifth of the lecture is going to be called first examples. What can you do with this universal engine that computes reduced Grubner basis? So let me define the standard monomials for you. So the standard monomials. The standard monomials of a given ideal with respect to a fixed monomial ordering is the following set denoted S subordering of I. So this is the set of all monomials x to the b, where b is a non-negative integer vector and that monomial is not in the initial ideal. So these are all the monomials not in the initial ideal. If you draw a picture of a monomial ideal, that's a staircase. So these are all the monomials under the staircase, not in the ideal. Those are the standard monomials. Now there's an important theorem. Which answers a question I asked an hour ago, namely, the standard monomials 
form a basis, a vector space basis, a, uh, for the k vector space. Well, the polynomial ring mod i, right? How do you compute in a quotient ring? Well, you need to somehow write down elements, right? Just when you mod out your group by a normal subgroup, you need a rewriting system. So in this case too, you need to ideally have a vector space basis, and the vector space basis is given by the set of standard monomials. This set is unique and canonical as soon as you choose a monomial ordering, right? So these are all the monomials not in the ideal. So, so in that sense, this vector space comes with the basis, and my belief is confirmed. The vector spaces, spaces come with basis. How do you prove this? Well, how do you prove that a set is a basis for a given vector space? Well, you have to show that the set spans, and you have to show that it's linearly independent. Well, the spanning property is not difficult, right? Because you write down a list of polynomials and you underline their leading terms, okay? Well, this may or may not be a Grubner basis, but you can take any polynomial, modulo those relations, and write them as linear combinations of, poly of polynomials, no term of which is divisible by an underlined leading term. Sort of obvious, right? Because Suppose in your polynomial you have, take any polynomial, you see something that's still divisible, well then divide, right? Multiply, a multi, no, take a multiple of the element in the basis, add, keep going, and by Dixon's lemma everything will converge. This is called the division algorithm, okay? So the division algorithm takes any polynomial and writes it mod the ideal as a linear combination of those monomials that are not divisible by underlying leading terms. The non-trivial part is linear independence, but that's equivalent to the Grobner basis property, right? So if you recall the definition of a Grobner basis offered 35 minutes ago, then the axiom of a Grobner basis is exactly saying that these guys are linearly independent, right? That's it. So the standard monomials are vector space basis, and that explains with a tiny pinch of the Chinese remainder theorem, why the number of standard monomials is equal to the number of zeros of our system of equations. Okay, first examples. So I'm gonna give you some examples. So in my examples, x is bigger than y is bigger than z, and everything is lexicographic. The first example, I like to tell you about implicitization of plane curves. Okay? Well, suppose you take the following polynomials y minus x cubed plus 4x and z minus x cubed minus x plus one. Now I think about this as a parametric representation of a plane curve. So you have a, a plane curve in the plane with coordinates y and z. So think about the yz plane. In the y plane, you have a parametric curve given by y is equal to x cubed minus 4x, and z is equal to x cubed plus x minus 1. So that describes a plane curve, a curve in the yz plane where x is the parameter. Okay? Now it turns out that this curve is an algebraic curve. Right? It's given, it's described implicitly by a polynomial in y and z as the vanishing set of a polynomial in y and z. And we can calculate this, namely it will be in g. So the reduced Grobner basis contains the implicit equation of your curve. Right? So if you feed this as the input to your equation, what is the zero set of this? 
Well, this zero set is a curve in three-dimensional space, and that curve is the graph of the aforementioned parametric curve. So the parametric curve I spoke about is given by a map from the real line R1 into R2. It's the map that takes x to x cubed minus 4x and the other thing. This f describes the graph of this map, and now we're eliminating the parameter from the equations of the graph, and we get the implicit equations, and you just look at the reduced Gropner basis, and voila, it stares at you. Okay? And since you are not afraid of computing, you can compute this. And you don't need any software whatsoever, right? You go to Wolfram Alpha or whatever, Sage, anything, and just type in these polynomials and you eliminate x. And this will, under the hood, is the Buchberger algorithm. Now here's another thing you can do. <clears throat> Let's do arithmetic with algebraic numbers. Okay? Now this is my, I really like this field. I like this field of algebraic numbers. Now I also like the field of rational numbers. I, I love the field of rational numbers because you know you can write them down, like 5 7 is a great number. I don't like the real and complex numbers so much because they're kind of useless, right, for computational purposes because you can't write down a real number. I mean, you're dead before you're done writing them down, right? You cannot, so most real numbers you cannot write down. They're a great idea. The idea of continuity and real numbers is a pretty good idea, but you can't actually compute with real numbers. But you can compute with real algebraic numbers. So these are in the algebraic closure of Q. So these are real numbers and, and complex numbers that satisfy a polynomial equation with rational coefficients. Those we can compute with. Those I can email you. But I can't email you a real number, sorry. I won't, okay? So, uh, so that's it. So how do we do this? Um, let's do an example. So, uh, so let's compute the sum of two algebraic numbers. So let z be the sum. And let's take two simple ones. Let's take the cube root of 7 and the fourth root of 5. So how can we represent this? Well, let's call this number x. Let's call this number y. So the task is to add x plus y, but to reveal the answer as an algebraic number. Right? So I claim that this z is algebraic. of degree 12 over Q. It satisfies a polynomial with rational coefficients of degree 12. But how do you find that polynomial? Well, it's in the Grobner basis, right? So the minimal polynomial that represents this algebraic number is in the reduced Grobner basis G where the input is a specification of the problem, right? So the input polynomial is a specification of the sentence. I'm going to take this sentence and I translate that sentence into a set of polynomials, right? So x, whatever x is, it should satisfy the equation x cubed minus z. Whatever y is, it should satisfy the equation y to the, what did I say, y to the fourth minus 5. Whatever z is, it should satisfy the equation z minus x minus y. Done. Right? The reduced Gropner basis has the desired equation of degree 12 in z. Um, let's do another one. Now, symmetry is very, very, very important. So. Uh, So Sn is the symmetric group on n letters, the n factorial permutations. Now as you peruse the schedule, now what's nonlinear algebra, right? That's kind of weird, right? Because that doesn't sort of exist, right? So every university has a course on linear algebra. Every university has several courses on linear algebra. But at this point, essentially no university has a course on nonlinear algebra. 
So this is, of course, a nonlinear. What, what, so what should nonlinear algebra be? Well, so here's an attempt at a possible list of topics. But among the topics, you see certainly representation theory, June 12th, and invariant theory, June 19. Right? Because symmetry is very, very important. Some of you are physics students. It's the difference between solving the problem and not. Right? Lots and lots and lots of problems have symmetry. And if you exploit the symmetry, maybe you can solve the problem. If you don't exploit the symmetry, you're not going to solve the problem. Right? So, so representation theory will become quite important later in June. Um, so this is the regular representation of the symmetric group S3. So let's code this as a little Grobner problem. So let's say F is the set of elementary symmetric polynomials in a bunch of variables. So second one is xy plus xz plus yz. The third one is xyz. And g is uh, x plus y plus z, y squared plus yz plus z squared, so the, the reduced Grobner basis. And then the last one is just z cubed. Now what the reduced Grobner basis tells us, it tells us that the quotient ring is a six-dimensional vector space. Right? So, so I take the polynomial ring in three variables, x, y, z, modulo this ideal. And that's a six-dimensional vector space because there are six standard monomials. And the standard monomials, after all, are a vector space basis for the residue ring. Now this residue ring is a vector space, right? So you take the polynomial ring, modulo the ideal, generated by the elementary symmetric polynomials. The elementary symmetric polynomials are very important. And there are versions of elementary symmetric polynomials for other symmetry groups. If we mod out the ideal generated by the elementary symmetric polynomial, well, that's a vector space. But that vector space will be a module over the group. It will carry the representation. And that representation is called the regular representation. And indeed, 6 is 3 factorial, which is the order of the group, revealed by this reduced Grobner basis. So let's do two more examples. One more example, and then we'll break for lunch. <clears throat> let's try the following. Let's take two random homogeneous quartics in four variables. Okay, so by this I mean a homogeneous polynomial, and these are random such polynomials. So homogeneous means all terms have the same degree four. Right? So, so each of these polynomials has 35 terms. There are 35 monomials of degree four in four variables. And you pick a first random polynomial like this, and you pick another random polynomial like this, and you can do this over the lunch break, okay? Now this defines a curve. So the zero set of this is a curve. <laughs> Why is this a curve? Well, we're going to get to this. So the next lecture will be on algebraic varieties. So one week from now, Mateusz will lecture on algebraic varieties that are zero sets of polynomials. And, uh, and what people do is they usually you know, work this really is coordinates on a four-dimensional space, but they like to pass from this four-dimensional space to a three-dimensional projective space. If you're unfamiliar with projective geometry, the last chapter in uh, cox loche really has a very good description of projective geometry. So this defines a curve of degree 16 in three-dimensional projective space. Now let's do the following experiment. Let's calculate the reduced Grobner basis with respect to degree reverse, oh, so revlex, degree revlex, and let's also compute it for lex, or degree lex, everything is homogeneous, okay? So for reverse lexiographic term order, G has five elements. <coughs> 
of degree at most seven, okay? So again, the input is two random polynomials, homogeneous of degree four and four variables, and the output is pretty nice. It's two, it's seven, I'm sorry, five polynomials, and the largest degree you see is seven. It would be four plus four minus one, okay? The degree seven is the largest. Now do the lexicographic Grobner basis. So your unique reduced lexicographic Grobner basis, G, has 150 elements. Reduced Grobner basis has 150 elements of degree up to 73, okay? That's a very big output. There's polynomials up to degree 73, and there's 150 such polynomials. So why? How should you think about this? Well, first of all, you should think that these are really different term orders, right? So if anybody still believes that reverse lex is the same as lex in reverse order, that's not true, right? They're structurally very, very, very different. Now, which is better? Well, that depends on your perspective, right? Of course, the first is somewhat better, right? Because the output is much smaller, and the programs will terminate much, much, much faster, right? On the other hand, the second very big, ugly set contains a lot of information, right? So if a Grobner basis computation takes a very, 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 very long time, that's not because it's a terrible algorithm, it's because it computes a lot of stuff, right? So, so these 150 polynomials, and these polynomials of the degree up to at most 73, you may not like them, but they contain a lot of information, okay? So this is a, an example that you can try. I wanna end with one more definition, because that's important, and also comes up in the exercises. So the radical of an ideal I is a bigger ideal, typically. So the radical is, you know, written as the square root of i. So this is the set of all f in the polynomial ring um, such that there exists a natural number such that f to the s is an i. So, so equivalently, the radical of an ideal is the smallest radical ideal containing the given ideal. Okay, so remember earlier, about 80 minutes ago, we defined an ideal to be radical if it has the property that whenever a power of a polynomial is in, then the polynomial is in, and the radical of a given ideal is the smallest radical ideal containing the given ideal. And radical ideals are, again, very important in the next lecture or next week, and it's very good to practice computing them, so exercise eight. So somebody in the last row, maybe Max, will volunteer at 1.40 today, because people in the last row, by definition, are the ones who are volunteering. So Max will tell us this afternoon uh, what is the radical. Compute this for i equals x cubed minus yz, y cubed minus xz, and z cubed minus xy. Okay, so that's our system. Again, very similar to what we had before, but just slightly more tricky, right? So suppose in mathematics, in the sciences, we get this important scientifically applied problem that asks for all triples of numbers, x, y, and z, such that the cube of any number is the product of the other two. Let's pretend that this were an important problem. What are those numbers? Anyway, so this afternoon, we're gonna meet at 1.30. We're gonna compute examples. Examples are very, very, very important, and I'm being filmed now. Theorems, proving theorems is for those who can't do examples. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you at 1.30.